everybody. This is Jeff Morton, one of the hosts of Returning to Eden. We're going to talk about that a little bit in just a little bit more. And I'm joined by Dr. Dina Dye. Say hello, Dina. Hello, Dina. No, hi. <laughs> Dina, um, I think we should tell the people a little bit about ourselves. Just take a couple minutes and sure. I'm actually feeling better and able to do the show tonight. Yes, I've come back from the dead. It's been one of the worst weeks I can remember. I am still a little hoarse, still a little congested, but you guys that know me and love me, you'll, you'll bear with me. Uh, so for those of you who are watching this um, broadcast here and if you don't know who on earth we are, uh, I'm Dr. Dina Dye with Foundations and Torah Ministry. Um, my doctorate is Hebraic Studies in Christianity, and I have been doing this that I do for nearly 40 years. And recently, in the last uh, three years, I have two books out, part of a trilogy, The Temple Revealed in Creation and The Temple Revealed in the Garden. Currently, I'm working on The Temple Revealed in Noah's Ark. And just with all of this different type of uh, research, et cetera, has kind of brought uh, Jeff and I to this place. It's a question a lot of people have asked. And since we've had to rethink a lot of things, this is just one more area. So, Jeff, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, I'm Jeff Morton. I'm just a kid from New York. I've been in the Pacific Northwest since I was 17 years old. Uh, I really didn't get serious about studying the Bible until about 1998. And then in 2007, I had a, a rather unique experience. I was in a church. I heard a voice say, go learn why I was Jewish. And everything from that moment forward changed. I wrote a book. I've actually written a couple of books. Uh, I only have one published. The other one is uh, Women, the Crown Jewel of Creation, which has been a labor of love. It's been about four years in the making, and I'm still not done with it yet. Uh, I came across Dr. Dina Dye probably about 10 years ago, but I really, uh, she really captured my, my mind uh, about four years ago in Portland, Oregon, where she made a statement, and it resonated with what happened to me in 2007. And so my journey really... I guess I would say my the, the moment that I took responsibility for my journey in knowing the things of God, it happened in 2007. And here we are 11 years later, and I'm just literally amazed, blown away. But I'm also thinking out of the box and reading material that's challenging a lot of the stuff that I learned as a Christian. So that's yeah. kind of my story. My, uh, by the way, my website is jeffsmorton.com. It's just a static website. I do a few things every once in a while there. But most of the stuff I do is on social media and uh, various things that I do in the community. But, Dina, your website is Foundations and Torah. How long has that been around? Uh, foundationsandtorah.com. Uh, since 2012, that's when I got the website. I also have a website, dinadie.com, which is more an author website. Foundations and Torah is where all my material is, really. Uh, I've got quite a bit of material on there. It is a membership site, but uh, there's free and whatever you want to pay per month, and uh, there's there really is a lot of material. One of the things, as I've been working through uh, Noah, just trying to lay the foundation there, and I'll just say this, and then we'll talk uh, just briefly about returning to Eden, because we are coming back, folks. Yes. But the, the where we're coming from is uh, trying to get back to the original context of the Bible, which is an ancient Near East document. And so this, uh, this has kind of become my focus. Now, within that, we're looking at uh, cultural context, historical context, language, literary tools and devices. All these sort of things go along with it. So I don't, you know, it's not, this is not in a vacuum. This isn't all, you know, the sort of meanderings of my own mind or Jeff's. But we're trying to use uh, the foundation of the ancient Near East world and we do find that you, you don't really see, uh, certainly the scholarship is, is that way, and Christian scholarship uh, looks at the ancient uh, Near East world. Uh, some of the Hebrew uh, Jewish scholars do as well, but by and large, this is a, a relatively untouched area. And we are very fortunate because it's really only been in the last 150 years that we've had access to the material that actually came out of the ground to show us. So. Up until that point, the folks doing the research didn't really have that. So we're trying to return back to where we believe the Bible was, the, the, the context in which the Bible was written. So with that said, uh, our show, Returning to Eden, really has that basis to it. So 
It's a radio show with the two of us back in April because I had a move <laughs> and now I'm sick. And anyways, hopefully this is all done and, and the show will return. I know a lot of you are fresh. Where, where have you guys been? But um, that is that is the foundation of for the show is is looking at the material in the Bible from that perspective. Well, and you want to say something about the show? About the show, yeah. In April, we took a hiatus. We were both overwhelmed with a variety of uh, personal things and whatnot. Dina had to up and move, and I had a whole lot of different things happening. Uh, so we 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 told you all, and we apologize in advance that we'd be gone for a couple of months. Well, it's been a crazy summer. <laughs> it's been an interesting summer. So we've been gone, but we're bringing the show back. We're no longer going to do a live broadcast. Uh, we find that most of you listen to the um, podcast or at a later time, uh, which gives us an opportunity to not have to be a certain in a certain place at a certain time. So Dean and I are going to pre-record the show, and then I'm going to do the editing that I've always done. And we'll probably post it on the various websites, certainly our podcast, uh, on Sunday evening. That's kind of the goal right now, and that's kind of the formula that we're using. So we'll probably tape the show uh, in the morning, and then I'll edit it and put it posted around in the evening time. And then, of course, uh, it'll be placed all over the place, just like in the past. Uh, <clears throat> Dina, uh, you, you mentioned trying to see the Bible from the ancient lens. And for me... And I got to give a great big shout out to Rico Cortez and even Daniel McGurr, because if it wasn't for those two guys who introduced me to the ancient Near East Treaty Covenant system, I would have never known this existed. And, and you know, I started reading Meredith Klein and various resources, but this largely died out in the churches in the early or the late 60s, 70s. Uh, this this topic kind of vanished. So now it's coming back and really largely we're just trying to look at the lens of what the writer was talking about and also the cultural continuity and integrity of how they wrote. They didn't have paragraphs. They didn't have exclamation points. They didn't have what you and I would have, nor did they have our lens. So everything that we do is in returning to Eden is returning to the, the, the mind of the writer and trying to work ourselves forward not necessarily from a religious paradigm, but from a kingdom paradigm. And we're going to find out, you'll find out if you listen to Dina and I, there's all kinds of kingdom language. Dina, even when we say the word kingdom language, most people don't understand what that means. But that's kind of what we're trying to dig into and pull forward because right. yep. the Bible is about thy kingdom come. And that's what the entire Bible is trying to get us to understand. Yeah, and just sort of a word about the writers, because uh, the question is always asked, okay, you know, we're looking at a narrative, is this historical or is this metaphorical, and how do we figure out which is which? And yes, the, the foundation of the narrative is historical, accurate people, ge geographical locations, etc. But that is not the focus uh, for the writers. The writers wrote with that as the backdrop, but they were more concerned about the interpretation. So what they've handed down to us is more interpretive. How did the writers interpret the events surrounding them? And so that's what we're trying to dig in. It's difficult. There's no question about it. But what happens is that the interpretation of what they've written becomes the inspired word of God versus the historical. So. We don't want to dismiss the historical because obviously the Bible is historically accurate, but that's just not their focus. Their focus is on the interpretation of those events. So um, that's important going forward and certainly in this discussion as well. And, and just to add a disclaimer, it's really important that you, that you understand that Dean and I are exploring theories and parallelisms and patterns. Uh, Dean is a little bit older than me, but she wasn't in the garden, okay? <laughs> Not I don't know. Maybe I was. <laughs> Nor were students of Moses, if in fact he wrote the Torah. I mean, I didn't realize there was a lot of controversy about all of that. It just blows my mind. The more you dig, the more questions that, that pop up, mm -hmm. the more controversies that you start finding, not only in our century, but in centuries previous to us. The controversy 
continue. Hence, the discussion continues even to this this day. But we weren't there, folks. So keep that in mind. And nor are we going to give you any absolutes or some kind of dogma. We're just looking at the material with the fresh eye, kind of taking that out of the box and having a discussion different than the last, uh, I would say, the last 150 years. Is that a fair statement, Dina? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, we're looking at a big volume of time. And so things do evolve. You know, there's nothing static. And so what something was thought of, you know, 5,000 years ago is not going to be thought of in the same way today, obviously. And I just feel, you know, somewhat of the amateur detective, a little Hercule Poirot for you Agatha Christie fans, uh, in trying to decipher what the Bible is saying. Now, this doesn't change, you know, for instance, going to the Psalms when things are difficult and going through trials and and difficult times that you can read the Psalms at any time and be um, just kind of be transformed and delivered. We're, you know, we're not, um, we're not saying that isn't important or that's, you know, you go to the Bible for healing and for wholeness and health and the word of God that, you know, a two edged sword that cuts through and divides between the bone and the marrow. But this is simply an effort on our part to try to understand what the scriptures are saying and in no way overrides the relationship one has with God and the, the message of going forth uh, as a kingdom person and uh, being kind and helping people and working with, you know, widows and orphans and serving in all that different dimension. Uh, I, I don't want anyone to think that this is more important than that because it's not. Right. And, 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 and to even go one step further, we're not trying to prove or disprove the Messiah. We, we absolutely are convinced in the renewing of the covenant. Amen. And we know who he is, and we're looking forward to his return, and we want to make Amen. sure. I mean, this is a Jewish gal that's that's spent 40 years studying this material, but her upbringing was based on what the Jewish culture taught. And I think you were a conservative Jewish person. Yeah. I had a dog named Satan, so I was as far away from the Bible as <laughs> probably get. Well, right. this is right up your alley. <laughs> well, it's interesting because... Uh, our topic tonight is Genesis 3.1, and we'll probably, you know, kind of meander a little bit because there's a lot to talk about here, but we want to kind of look at the statement itself. And the reason this all happened for me, Dina, is I started pondering the idea that a snake slithered up to Eve and started having a chat with her. I started going back and breaking down the sentences and looking at everything in Hebrew, and I started questioning the traditional view that a serpent started talking to Eve and all of a sudden chaos happened. So before I, I, you're the one who has the volume of knowledge on this. So I'd like you to kind of pepper the conversation with some background, if you will, as to why we're here. Okay. Well, um, I think before we get to Genesis chapter three, there's a couple of things that need to be said. And, and, For the ancient world, the cosmos, the creation, the cosmos in Genesis chapter 1, it it was understood in the ancient world to be a kingdom. Okay, this is not about a religion. This is not about science, and it's not really even about history. It's about a kingdom. And so how a kingdom or how creation operates now, our God on, in Genesis chapter 1 laid out the pattern, an architectural pattern for how the creation came forward and how, how a house was made for his presence. But you have to understand, this is true in all those other cultures at that time, in ancient Mesopotamian, the Akkadian, Sumerian cultures, and all the, the city-states and the worlds of the gods and goddesses. They all understood that the cosmos was a kingdom. Okay, this is so this is nothing new, but this is not how we look at the scriptures. We do not look at the scriptures um, as a as a cosmic kingdom. So that's kind of problematic. So the cosmic rule of God is key. And the ancients viewed it exactly the same way, even though they had, you know, their their pantheon of gods and goddesses. And so the cosmic rule of God What's significant about it is that it reproduces after its own kind. That's the whole structure of Genesis chapter 1. You go through. That's the point. To bear fruit, 
to be fruitful and multiply and reproduce after its own kind, so to bring forth life. The, the cosmic rule of the gods, if we go back to ancient Mesopotamia, even back into like 3400 BCE, 4000 BCE, was to conquer, to conquer, to expand territory. And they did that by destroying stuff and killing people and, and going to war. So what that, that, you know, that's like killing the seed versus, versus reproducing the seed. So that sets up our conflict between two kingdoms from the beginning all the way through to Revelation, you know, the end of Revelation. And so that's the nature of the battle between the, the kingdoms of this world, the cosmic rule of the gods, and the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Okay, so this is this, this, um, this, is this contrast that's going on from the beginning. So when a king, um, let's say you had a city like uh, what I write about in the garden, uh, right. the garden book, the city of Uruk. And so the goddess over that city, her, her name was Inanna. So she would, uh, she would designate someone to be the king over that city. And so the king uh, was basically a man, <laughs> But the idea was, with, with the ancient world, the king always wanted to raise himself up to be divine. So in ancient Egypt, the, the pharaohs were already assumed to be divine, but you didn't have that. It wasn't really the case in Mesopotamia. And so the domain of kings, as the king is raised up divine, if you will, uh, the domain of kings becomes the heavenlies, the sort of cosmic so all these battles that we see going on in the cosmos and the heavens is, the, it is connected to the rulership of the king over that particular city. Does that make sense? It, not only that, but when we look in the book of Revelations, and this, this is the only place in Revelation where it talks about, and I saw that beast throw cast down. You know, the <clears throat> puzzling thing about that statement is the only place in all of scriptures where it's made but if we look at it from the perspective you just described, this is is um, this is classic for how they would have written about a great big battle between a god in the sky or some god, uh, whatever. It could have been anybody's god. We're just happy to be talking about the Hebrew scriptures. But in that world, the battle was about this king who, whoever he was, was now cast down out of the place of the gods, and he's right. on. It was so, to take away his divinity. The, the goal of the king was to be deified. He wanted to be equal to the gods, to be deified. And so, um, but there, you know, and that basically that's how God judged. He he removed the sort of the divinity, if you will, I don't know, for lack of a better word, of that God. I mean, you jumped ahead a little bit, but if you go to Isaiah fourteen twelve, and this this particular verse is not translated all that well, though it'll it'll say uh, Lucifer. It, it'll mention Lucifer, but if you read it in its context, it says, how you have fallen from heaven, O bright star, and it, some will have Lucifer, son of the dawn, for you said, I will ascend to heaven, which is the desire of every king. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will make myself like El Yom. So now, who is this talking about? This is not Lucifer. This is talking about King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And God is going to throw him down because he desired to to exalt himself about over the God of the universe, over Yahweh, the God of gods. And so when when a king is removed out of that heavenly sphere, that's a, a statement of God's taken him out. OK, now, God, of course, you are allowed, however you want to look at it, Nebuchadnezzar to um to judge Israel, but God is the one who would remove him. And so the world of the kings and their minions and their retinue and their all their subject, whatever, functions in the heavenly realms. That's just how it's described by the ancient world. You know, that's really, it's, it's really important that, that we understand that because these writers are not talking about a, a red dude with pointed tail and ears. They're talking about kingdoms that have fallen or, or rose up against the authority of Almighty God and the consequences they were brought down. They were destroyed. They were, 
they were completely, utterly crushed. And the other thing that started me on this journey, too, was nowhere in all of scriptures does it describe Satan or Lucifer as being a king who overpowered a kingdom and took authority over that land. It's always been a Nebuchadnezzar. It's always been a Pharaoh. It's always been, well, it could have even been Genesis 3.1. All of a sudden, here's this bad dude who comes against the authority of God in the temple complex of the Garden of Eden, and all of a sudden, chaos is crazy, and we've got a great big mess. And so this story is Israel's story, but it's also every story in the Bible where mankind has rose up against the authority of God. That's kind of what what we're talking about in three one, and I know Dina, you have the background and you've certainly written about it. But we're talking about looking at this not as this fantastical story, but how the writer would have interpreted the events that we're talking about. Go ahead, Dina. Okay. Yeah. So now the. It, it, whoever you read, uh, scholars, Christian scholars, et cetera, will talk about the serpent as being a chaos figure. That's pretty much what they, they all agree on. But the, the figure that causes chaos in the world, uh, in the empire, if you will, is the king. The king is the only one if, that actually causes the chaos. So if you have a righteous king seated on the throne, ruling justly and righteously, and extending cross. Uh oh, Dean, I think we just lost you. Prosperity and blessing to the empire. Uh oh, am I here? Yeah, Hello? you're here. You're here. You came back. Okay. Um, the king is the one who brings order to the empire by ruling rightly and justly and by extending blessing and mercy. Now, a bad king doesn't operate the same way. A bad king operates using lies and is one who is unjust. And so he brings oppression and enslavement, and that is what causes the chaos. So it is the king who is the chaos figure in whatever empire world we are talking about. So uh, one of the things I kind of have to mention here, um, in, because let me just say, uh, as you look at the evolving meaning of the serpent, we were we will find that when you come to the Babylonian period, now that'd be the Neo-Babylonian period, that at that point the kings of, of uh, Babylon were kind of associated with, with serpent language, okay? But not necessarily true earlier, the first Babylonian empire. But so with that in mind, let me just explain something. So for my research in uh, with the Noah story, I have been coming... I've been reading a lot of different scholars, and what I'm finding is that a lot of scholars now are saying or seeing that the Bible um, was probably written much later than we thought, perhaps uh, towards maybe sometime in Isaiah or later, or from the exilic or the post-exilic period. But their focus was on the, ex the Babylonian exile because... This was the most traumatic event in, in Israel's history, and that became the lens by which they saw their own history. Um, it was kind of a, a driving force in how they reported on, say, the Torah, for example. So let me just give you a couple of quotes here. This is from Walter Brugman, and he says that it is now increasingly agreed that the Old Testament in its final form this isn't discounting all the oral tradition, and saying, but in its final form, is a product of and a response to the Babylonian exile. The Torah was likely completed in response to the exile. Now, the use of the old materials are not in doubt by any question um, that uh, Israel's document, that Israel had certainly documented, recorded, told, passed down the stories, written orally, whatever for hundreds and hundreds of years before the exile. We don't dispute that in any way. And some of the earlier records relate more to sort of deeds, uh, land deeds, court, pol political things, etc. And eventually those things came to be included as part of the sacred scripture. But all of this was in the context of Israel's national crisis. 
And so the suggestion is that the Babylonian exile is the driving force for the entire Bible. And this is a quote here. Israel's moment of national crisis drove their theologians to engage their past history creatively. So if that is the case, and I, you know, obviously I cannot prove this, but I'm this in my reading, but if that is the case, do we not approach this Genesis chapter three as them reporting on the context being the Babylonian exile and that they are writing their history only in a more creative or interpretive form is what I was talking about the, the writers. So with that said, if we look at Genesis 3.1, that uh, talks about the serpent and the hash was more cunning, shrewd, crafty than any other. Some translations will be beast in the field. Um, the, the better word, chaya, is a, a living, a, something that's alive or living in the field, not just uh, not an animal, a beast animal. Um, but to be to be shrewd or and, and certainly can mean that I'm not discounting it. But the, the Hebrew root word there, aram, means to make something naked or to uncover something so that it's exposed, which is exactly what the exile did to Israel. It exposed who they were, and it brought shame on them. So this story that we're going to go through in Genesis 1, if we were to think about it in terms of the Babylonian exile, um, if that's kind of the, the sort of lens there, now we see a story that brings shame and exposure and nakedness. And the language of exile is one of shame. It's shame language and, 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 and nakedness and exposure. So that's kind of interesting. If, if that's if that's you know a way to view it, again, J Jeff and I are just discussing this. You know, I mean, you know, I'm an outside the box kind of person, but I'm just for your consideration that perhaps uh, there's a different way to look at it. You, uh, Jeff, you want to comment on that? N.T. Wright makes a similar comment or statement. He says, if the average Christian reading the Genesis account is going to be reading the creation account, but the average Jewish person who, who reads that account is going to say immediately, this is Israel's story, which yeah. goes back to what you're talking about, because we see the story of Israel. That's kind of what got me on all of this, Dina. Yeah. If we see the story of Israel in the, um, the Exodus or the, the, not the Exodus, but being cast out, being taken right. out of the presence of the place of God. Now, all of a sudden you have this evil thing that shows up, creates chaos because of a behavior or a failed behavior whereby Adam wasn't tending the garden. He wasn't being a king. He wasn't, he was being an Ahaz or a Manasseh. He wasn't being the righteous bearer of the very reason he was elevated up to this position. So now we see a king possibly crashing through the North Gate or the Northern Wall and taking them out of the place of freedom in the presence of God the place of honor, the place where they were elevated to do a very specific thing to shame and dishonor mm -hmm. and captivity. And so yeah. we see that their child was raised up with the shame and the dishonor and captivity to the point that where he committed a murder, if we look at the story that way, because in the presence of God, that would have never happened. And this is this this is what got me thinking. Why do we exclude Adam and Eve from the story of Israel? Because to me, they are the story of Israel. Absolutely. So if, if in fact, the Babylonian exile is what's in mind for, for these writers, then the story of Adam and Eve really becomes the story of Israel's exile from the garden, from the land. And that the king who came and conquered and deported and killed and destroyed and you know, set fire to the temple in Jerusalem, that king was Nebuchadnezzar. And and again, what I said earlier, by the time we get to the this period, uh, sixth century, that Satan, if you will, the serpent, as the sort of king chaos figure. Um, and we don't, we, it, earlier on in say like 3000 BC or 3500 BC, BC, we don't really see that. But if in fact this, story is that significant um now we have to look at adam and eve from that perspective and so it does help explain things in the garden and who this chaos figure was as king nebuchadnezzar who you know who 
in the in the same way that Israel failed, violated the covenant, you know, and God and judged them. So we're seeing the same thing in the garden. Yeah, and if we if we just for a moment challenge the ideal that Adam was put to sleep, cut in half, a rib was taken out of his body, and all of a sudden, voila, we have a female running around having a dandy old time with the serpent. If you really just stop and consider that and understand that 3,800 years ago or whenever that story was penned, there's an interpretation being valued and placed into literally what we call the Bible. But, folks, if I cut a woman in half, grabbed a rib, and turned her, uh, a man in half, grabbed a rib, God can certainly do that. But is that what the writer of the story is trying to convey? That's where Dean and I are, that's where we live. What is being said here? Because serpents don't talk to people, and if you cut somebody in half, take a rib out of their body, it's pretty hard to turn something into a woman. It just doesn't make sense. But what does make sense is the Babylonian story, the story of the exile. That's what makes more sense, and I think that's what the writers, echoing Dina sentiment here, that the writers are really interpreting that story throughout most of Tanakh, or the Old Testament, if you will. And yeah, we, see the same thing happen again. we see the same thing happen at the time of Rome, and I know I'm going to jump a little ahead here, but we see the exact same play in Rome, and what I found interesting about that was just like Adam was inserted into the garden, Yeshua was inserted in the land, and we see the same kind of thing happening, only this time he didn't fail. He went to make a place for his bride. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I don't think we really appreciate, I mean, I don't, I didn't, just how devastating and how it, in, how it affected the very DNA of, of Israel, um, that is the Babylonian exile. I really don't think we have a good appreciation for what that caused. The, and the, the humiliation, like Israel, I mean, think of this, the Davidic kingdom, you know, David and Solomon. I mean, and it is at its height, and it's going and blowing. And, you know, we go down through the various kings of Judah, and there's some bad ones, but there, you know, some really great ones like Hezekiah and Josiah, et cetera, et cetera. And they have built this temple that is the crown jewel of the Middle East of the time, one of the wonders of the of the ancient world. Magnificent. I mean, no expense is spared to to build this magnificent home for the presence of God. And then look what happens. And well, you know, Dina, I really want to, I think that's key, and I think we can understand it better. It's something I've been doing. In fact, I, I shared this yesterday with a couple of young ladies. By the way, I see all of you who are joined our conversation here. We really do appreciate you being here. All of you show up on my screen, so I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. But I want to I wanna try to take what Dina just said and make a comparison. It would be no different than if the White House or the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., and this is something many of you have heard me say, because we're not different from the past. We're a product of it. So just like Solomon built the temple, he also built a house, a palace for himself. So if we juxtapose the, White, the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., and then the White House, we see a replay of that kind of structure. And we see the center of the governmental system of the United States of America is Washington, D.C. Now, consider this. If we had an invading army that came in and completely eviscerated the Capitol building, destroyed the White House, took the government into captivity, and then relocated the citizens of the United States of America, I, I don't know how many of you who would go, wow, that was really awful. But how many of you would credit that kind of punishment to the behavior of the nation and the judgment that God posed or put on, on the people here? Because that's how traumatic it would have been for Israel to lose the seat of their authority, to lose the palace, to lose the place where the presence of the Lord dwelled, to be scattered out of their country, and to be humiliated across the Mesopotamian world. 
That's what we're talking about. And who's to say that that couldn't happen again today? Because it can. That's, if you understand how big a deal that would be in our generation, then just go back 2,000 years or, or whenever, or back to the first temple and, and realize the magnitude of seeing an entire nation removed. Well, and the humiliation that they brought on God himself. Because the nations are going, oh, yeah, you know, you build this beautiful temple. It's the center of worship. Your God resides there. His presence is there. And now your God is going to allow it to be destroyed. And you're going to be taken captive by other nations who are going to enslave you and oppress you. And uh, uh, who, who could even fathom that level of humiliation? So that's a very important the, the Bible, it, it, many of the stories in the Bible are an effort to um, to deal with that humiliation, if you will. The dramatizing. Right? Yeah. Really? So as we're, as we're reading and studying. What? I was just going to say that's why we have the hyperbole and the analogies and the metaphor, because they're really trying to accentuate the story. but And they come out of a mythical world, which you've written about many, many times. So that's their resource. They're using mythical, uh, a mythical conversation to exaggerate the story, but to drive the point home. Yeah. And that's what we are, that's what both of your books are trying to, trying to point out. And certainly John Walton and, and, you know, when you told me about Michael Morales and I started looking at his stuff, Dina, how come we never hear this? in the sanctuary uh, right. with the scholarly world knows this stuff sideways, upside down, backwards, front, but we, it doesn't filter down to the Sunday service. And even in the messianic world and even in the Jewish world, I mean, today's uh, Jewish rabbis and whatnot, they, they don't touch this conversation. It's not there other than the gentleman you told me about. And I did take a look, uh, yeah. Victor Hurwitz, and yes, he's, he's point on some of the stuff I looked at in the last couple of hours, I didn't know about them. I've been looking for people like him in the Jewish world. Well, you know? there are, there are, you know, there are a number of them. Um, and, and that's why, you know, we're doing what we're doing uh, as an effort to be a bridge between the scholarly community and the folks, because I know a lot of people, you know, most people are not going to go read some of these books that we read. And um, there's some excellent scholars out there. I mean, they've devoted their lives to this. And uh, I think if we can serve as that bridge and bring that material and then try to make sense of, uh, you know, what the Bible is saying, again, not discounting our call and our ministries, but just to try to understand it in a better light and not um, we do goofy things, you know, <laughs> because of the way we think we understand it. And so uh, hopefully that'll, that'll help. But this 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 world, this war between you know the kingdoms, the king of this world and the king, our God. It, you know, this is that's the war in the Bible. Of course, through the Bible we go, you know, through the various um, like Egypt and the, all the, the different pharaohs from uh, Babylon, ne Nebuchadnezzar and his son right. Eben Merodach, and the Assyrian Sennacherib and Tiglat Pileser and Sh Sargon and Sh Shalmanser. And the Medio Persian, and got the Circes and the Artaxerxes and the Darius. And but one of the most important figures in the Bible, I would maintain, would be Cyrus. Right. And if so, what your what your average king did again was to expand territory by going to war and destroying and killing everything in sight. But listen to the, this was on something called the Cyrus Cylinder. It's in the British Museum, and this is what. This is what Cyrus reportedly said. I am Cyrus, king of the world. When I and my soldiers entered Babylon, we did not conquer and kill. Well, that's my point. We, they did not conquer and kill. He said, I did not allow anyone to terrorize the land. I kept in view the needs of the people and all its sanctuaries to promote their well-being. I put an end to their misfortune. The great God has delivered all the lands into my hand the lands that I have made to dwell in a peaceful habitation, freed all the slaves. I put an end to their misfortune in slavery, and he was referring to the Jews and other minorities. This is, uh, this is a, um, I can't even think of the word, this, this is historical 
this particular king is operating in the shalom, if you will, the Sabbath, the rest that he would bring to the empire in order for order and stability to come. And he gave that to the Jewish people to be able to go back and to rebuild the temple, etc. This is profound because we don't see any of these other kings doing this. Um, he stands alone in that regard, and that is why he is a Messiah figure because of the, the idea of restoring the creation, restoring the cosmos, and being a truly um, uh, ground zero you know, king, if you will, in the cosmic sense. And, and a Gentile king at that. I mean, he yes, was yes, yes. not part of the house of Israel, the house of David. But we can talk about Hezekiah, and I know you did a whole series on Hezekiah. He tried to do the same thing, but his foible was... He let a bad ruler in his. <laughs> yeah. He, he let somebody in to the Holy of Holies. You made a comparison to Hezekiah, and uh, and Adam. Can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? I don't remember what I said. <laughs> no. no. Um, so we have you know Adam is in the garden under the tree, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, no complex. <laughs> Let's just call it what it was. King, king, king figure. Um, but he, if in fact uh, the serpent represents a king figure, he allowed a king into the sacred space that had no business being there. And that king um, took advantage of him and worked from the inside out, <laughs> literally. And so we have the same story I maintain with the King Hezekiah, who allowed the envoys of the King of Babylon to come into the temple and he showed them absolutely everything. Now, these are the envoys of the enemy. Right. And he was quite happy to let them in and show them all the silver and the gold, and the armory, the house of the forest of Lebanon, and everything else. And it's not very long after that that Nebuchadnezzar comes. I mean, he had all the inside plans. He knew what was there, and he knew what to take. And that is because uh, Hezekiah allowed an enemy it went from, to work from the inside out. And then his son came up to be horrific, you know. But he did end up well. <laughs> he started out poorly. Manashe. Yes, Manasseh, <laughs> Manashe. Yeah. But the point being is that, you know, we see this whole thing handed down. I'll tell you what, when you make a mistake in service to the king, the consequences are generational. They really yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, and that's important to the third and fourth generation, destruction. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. It's like the, if you if, if God appoints you to do something and then you screw it up, uh, I think of David's kids. They were a mess. They were a complete mess. But back to what our point is, is the serpent, is he a person? Or is he a little red guy with pointed ears and a red tail running around creating havoc in the Garden of Eden story? I believe that it's a person. I believe that it's, especially when we look at the vassal kingdom, the suzerain vassal, I think it's more like the caliph of a caliphate system or an evil empire that moves against the authority of God in through through Adam, like like what has always happened. Nebuchadnezzar, just go down the list. The, the Roman emperors, they all did the same exact thing. They moved against the authority of God Almighty who was revealing himself through his nation, his people. Dean, I don't know how to look at it any other way. It, it almost seems to me that the writer of the story is using Adam to tell the story of the Babylonian exile as opposed to the story of creation. I mean, it, it may be both. Uh, you know, I don't really know. Um, but, the, you know, you understand in Hebrew, you never, uh, in front of a personal name, you never have a the letter hey, which the letter hey means the. Yeah. And pretty much, except for one time, and that's the kind of debatable, but every time Satan Hasatan is used in the Hebrew Bible, it always has a hey in front of it. So it's not talking about a person with a name. It's right. talking about some kind of entity, the, the adversary, the accuser, if you will. So most of the times, uh, at least five of the times, it's referring to an actual human, military, political uh, figure, some sort of legal opponent. And then there are four times in which it's referring to some kind of divine being, which can also be the king, because every king in the 
in the ancient Mesopotamian world was desired was to be raised up and to become divine. Um, well, I mean, Dana, that the whole story of Job. Yeah, well, I was actually just going to say that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'll let you, because that whole story there, if we don't look at Job as being this poor downtrodden guy, but if we look at him as a high priest looking at the after, aftermath, the destruction of the temple, then the story makes more sense. So I'll right. let you. I'll well, let you go. and so we know, I mean, we don't know for sure if, if Job is a, you know, a high priest. Reading it, it, you know, we get the sense that he is. Regardless, we know he's wealthy and he's part of the power elite. Like, this isn't some guy with no influence and power. And those are the ones, it's the power elites that the power elites go after. So if this Hasatan figure is, is a king type or, a, you know, some sort of elite, it's the powerful going after the powerful. And, of course, he's attacking Job's designation by God of, of being one who is blameless and upright, which simply is stating this man has made a covenant with me, and I am providing him with that covenant protection. So it didn't really matter what happened because the covenant protection of God in that relationship is is what's at stake here. And I, I would maintain. I never thought about. You just put something in my head oh. because in the ancient Near East treaty covenant structure, God would have been obligated. Yes, He would have been obligated by His own word. Right. To protect. Yeah. I know. You just gave me a little zinger there, Dina. Okay. Well, I would also take that one step further and suggest that the story of Job is really the Adam story being repeated. That God was, you know, to provide the covenant protection for Adam, uh, you know, within the sacred space. Uh, Adam failed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a king came after him. Um, and he, you know, he allowed that king in the sacred space, but but Job, in essence, doesn't fail, and everything is removed. But the the king or whoever this figure is cannot take his life, and God, of course, restores everything back to him. So this is this is covenant language, which is a picture of the restoration of the very presence in the place of God. Because yeah. if Job is, if we're looking at Job, and we're looking at the writer using all this hyperbole and all this metaphors to talk about the destruction and the consequences that happened, I, really, just for a moment, I'll segue and say, if you if the United States of America was utterly destroyed, you had dead bodies all over the place, you're going to have sickness and disease, you're going to have death that's going to linger for months. Well, it would have been no different back in the ancient world. So here we've got Job, the book of Job, telling us of the horror that happened to the land to the people, to the families, and yet he was not destroyed. He did not die. He was protected, and everything was restored. This is classic kingdom language of the restoration of the kingdom of God. Yeah, and he was he language. was a man from Oots, you know, a man from the trees, you know, the forest. It's kind of interesting. Um, before we get to, I just want to make a couple of comments so we don't miss this. Because one of the main places we see them mentioned uh, the seat of Satan or the, the throne of Satan, if you will, in the Church of Pergamum in Revelation 2, verse 13. And really that has to do now our, you know, our new king <laughs> is Caesar. And so um, after Caesar, Augustus became deified, which is the goal of every king is to become deified by their God. Um <laughs> That was the goal is to make this throne here, this temple here for Caesar, because he was the man raised, you know, he was the king, the, the God that was raised up to to become king or to be deified. So the language of Pergamum is is saying exactly the same thing about Hasatan, if you will. Um, the only one of the other important places is in Revelation, of course. And here we have. Well, let me, I, well, I don't know where I wrote it, but if you go to Isaiah 27, I think that's where it is, talks about the Leviathan, the Leviathan, the dragon, the twisted serpent, usually in, the, in that context referring to Pharaoh. Again, the serpent connection to the, the god, and Pharaoh was a god, and to the Mesopotamians is, is, is strong there. So Revelation has this dragon language all over again. And um, 
No, I don't want to get too lost in this, but the idea in Revelation, of course, is to restore the cosmic rule of God on Earth through the Messiah. So we're back, you know, back to that cosmic um, restoration. And then it describes the great dragon being thrown down. So now when we look at Isaiah 14, we understand that was Nebuchadnezzar. In this case, it would be Caesar, that when Yeshua is resurrected from the dead, we'll see the great dragon, Caesar, the Leviathan, if you will, thrown down from the, the uh, oh my gosh, I am running out of power. <laughs> i got to plug my computer in. Can you talk, can you talk yeah, for five I, minutes? I want to talk about what she just said. Okay, I'll be right back. In the book of Daniel, when it talks about a 12, I think it's in 12, 7, it talks about the four kingdoms. And really, really, this is so critical that you just kind of park this in your brain. You, you look at the four kingdoms, you talk about uh, Babylon, then you talk about the Persians, then you talk about the Greeks, and then you talk about Revelation, or Revelation. You talk about Rome. And I find it interesting that the Messiah, Yeshua, came during the kingdom of Rome. And so when we're talking about when, when John or whoever wrote the book of Revelation, let's just throw John up there because that's what we've been taught. He's talking about the culmination of what Daniel was talking about. So when it says that there would be one raised up among you, and Daniel does a great job doing this, it's talking about the fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom is exactly when Messiah Yeshua was raised up and the kingdom of God was renewed in the earth and he was crowned king. There was so much that happened in the ministry of Jesus or Yeshua that we have, we're so disconnected from because we don't understand the ancient way that it was written. Dean, I'm talking about the fourth kingdom, which would have been Rome. Right. And, and, and so we see that I find it absolutely brilliant that Messiah Yeshua would come during the fourth kingdom because right. that's exactly what Daniel prophesied in chapter 12 or chiasm there between, uh, and, uh, chapter 7, chapter 3. And there's a chiasm there between 3 and 6 and seven, 2 and 7 in the book of Daniel. But it's still mm -hmm. talking about the kingdom of God being restored and what we don't really understand. Dina, I know this is a passionate subject for you. Is the inauguration of the king happened during the Messiah's reign or walk on this earth? This whole thing changed and was transformed during Messiah or Jesus's ministry, if you want to call it that. But he really, literally took back the reign of the kingdom of Elohim in the earth during the cosmic, that time. The cosmic rule—that's the key. Ahead. Yeah, it's not just he. You know, it, it wasn't just about Israel. It right. was about the cosmic rule. He was the one, the Messiah to come, the Son of God seated at the right hand to, to rule over the cosmos. Because at that time, those people understood that Caesar was running the show. He was running the cosmos with his gods. So this was a huge deal. We don't really, I mean, we understand, I guess, who Messiah is in that way. But, but this, was, this is way bigger, really, than we understand, is, I guess, my point. Well, and he was... So, he did it perfectly, which means he restored the honor. He restored the covenant. He, he, he literally was the guarantee. This is so critical. He was the guarantee that the nation of Israel would be brought forward again. He guaranteed that. And, of course, mm -hmm. it happened in 1948. And if you don't understand, there was not a human being on the planet that could have stopped Israel becoming a nation in 1948 because the blood covenant that was restored the one that was made with abraham was renewed and literally we witnessed it happen in 1948 if you can wrap your head around this this isn't about jew and christian this isn't about religious thing this is about we're literally witnessing the guaranteed nation of israel restored in order to receive the rightful receive the rightful king the inheritor <laughs> everything that God said he was going to do. That's what we're seeing happen. And the rulers of this world, not Hasatan, he's not running around, hopping on the throne. The rulers of this world are trying to stop it. Uh, in every generation, in every generation. And this is, this time is no different than the other. So in that 
passage in Revelation 12 talks about the ancient serpent called the devil, the Satan, who deceives the whole world. Well, that's exactly what the king, uh, the serpent did to Adam. It, he deceived him. It's what the serpent did to Hezekiah. He deceived him. It's what the serpent did to Israel, deceived them. Okay. And then when they were deceived and the, the covenant was broken because of that deception, um, and, and then an enemy could come in and run roughshod over, you know, at who, whoever we're talking about here. And, and that enemy would work from the inside out and destroy. But then it talks about um, he would be thrown down from heaven. Remember, everything, the world of the ancient kings was the heavenly realm. So that king, Caesar, would be thrown down from his place of deity to be and like the serpent in the garden eating dust. You, you know, you gotta, you gotta look at it like this, folks. God yanked him off of the throne and threw him in the dirt, kicked him out. Not this fireball come shooting out of the sky. The writer's trying to tell you that he was literally pushed off of his position into the dirt. And, and remember, the shape of the, the, of the of the temple shape was as a mountain. So the idea of this falling down from above, you know, from on high. From uh, from the top of the mountain, that was a very classic language for the ancient world. They understood that, you know. And it was a classic writing style. That's oh yeah, not a literal thing. It's a classic writing style having to do with kingdom language, based on who is the sovereign king versus all the vassal kings of the earth. This is so important, and it's when you understand the the the, the covenant structure of the kingdom of God. It's really like a constitution. And, and God is just restoring the constitution of his kingdom through the blood covenant of Messiah Yeshua. This is literally what's happening. It's just, oh, there's so much. To, we got about four minutes here. Okay. Well, uh, and remember in that, also in that passage, it talks about, you know, the dragon's thrown the earth, to the earth, the stalks the woman. She flees into the wilderness. And, it, it, you know, when you see that wilderness language, you know that that's tabernacle language. She's fleeing to the place of the presence of God and who's coming after her, the armies of Rome. So right. whenever you see floods and raging rivers and stuff like that, it's usually dealing with armies. In this case, the Roman army comes to sweep her away. And that's kind of, we have Noah language in there. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff. Um, and let me just kind of, I can close out with this verse in Luke 10, 18. So Yeshua said, I was watching Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What you just mentioned. So we're like, okay, this is, you know, beam coming out. But it's not saying that. It's talking about Caesar <laughs> falling from his, his perch on top of the mountain. His divinity shattered because there is only one who is divine. Behold, I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And so at that time, the enemy's kingdom was was the was Caesar in Rome that had exalted itself over all of the earth. And so that fall was connected to was connected to Caesar at that time. So all of the language of demons and legions and stuff, which is all kind of outer worldly stuff, is just relating to the to the um, to Caesar's Rome Roman Empire and his those who were in allegiance to him. So anyway. That's really important because they didn't, if I handed the, a globe of the earth to any one of the disciples or even to Paul or anybody, they would ask me, what is this? Because they didn't understand the world as being a globe suspended in space. They pictured the creation being the mountain or the, the high place. Then you had the place where the men dwelt, humanity dwelt, and then you had the underworld. So the language that they're writing about is about the sphere where all three of those elements existed. Not God's on the other side of the universe and one day he's going to come shooting across the sky and land on the Mount of Olives. No, he's going to come down from the high mountain and his feet are going to stand upon the place of his presence, which has always been Eden. And that talks, and that it talks about the Torah going forth from from Zion and from your line. Three. Yep, that's three Micah three four four three. Two of my favorite verses. Yeah, this guys, we're out of time. We only wanted to do this for an hour. I really appreciate all of you who, who are in the room. 
which is kind of nice. Returning to Eden will be back. I've got to head out to Indianapolis tomorrow night. I'll be gone for four days. But I think, Dina, you and I are going to do a show next Sunday. Or are you going to be in uh, – when are you leaving for Albuquerque or where are you going? No, I'm going to Amarillo to film uh, for Israel TV Network, which is next Sunday. But we may have some time. We'll, we'll talk. We, we're not tied to any particular day, so. Right. Anyway, this is Jeff Morton and Dr. Dina Dye. We really appreciate you guys tuning into us. And remember, we're not telling you how it was. We're talking about what we think the Bible is communicating, okay? God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Okay, I got to end the broadcast, and then I got to do it over here.